right, I guess we should uh, get rolling, right, Paul? Yeah, welcome everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> it's uh, Paul's got little George there, so <laughs> yep, maybe in her eight. And uh, so anyway, we, we decided to do this uh, little seminar. We, we did a, uh, some sale testing, some sale development. And while we did it, we also did a little clinic on the weekend. We did that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a few weeks ago. And um, it was a perfect opportunity to take some video of Paul and Sam um, sailing, because I was on the coach boat a lot and looking at the sails and um, use that opportunity to take some video. And then we was like, hey, let's, uh, let's use that video to do a, a, a debrief on what we kind of talked about, right? Yep. <clears throat> So the, the subject today is uh, we're going to spend a bunch of time on upwind, and I think that's going to cover the hour. We do have downwind if we, if we get there, so we got plenty to talk about, more to talk about than we can talk about in the hour, so that's good stuff. Um, but as far as the way this works is you, you're all muted, and, but uh, we would love it to be interactive. We'd love to see everybody ask all kinds of questions, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. So if anybody has any questions um, in the chat bar, just type in what you have as a question. I'm going to be moderating and then Mike and I will uh, hopefully be able to answer all those questions. So if you have anything you need uh, answered, let me know. Yeah, there are no dumb questions. So we'd love to hear from you. So that would be that would be great. So. All right. So to get started here. Um, we're going to start with uh, some steering videos. It was um you know, it was fun watching from off the boat because I could see different uh, different styles of steering. So um, this is Paul from behind. And I'm just going to play it a bit. Uh, it's choppy. This is in Jacksonville. And <clears throat> just, um, you know, you notice he's moving the tiller quite a bit, holding, your, uh, holding it above his leg. So... Tell us what you're thinking there, Paul. Yeah, so, uh, you know, driving style wise, I, I typically will, uh, you know, I've got a, a main sheet in one hand and a tiller in the other. I don't have a main sheet cleat, so I'm constantly adjusting the main sheet. But I try to keep the tiller, you know, as still as I possibly can, uh, realizing that, you know, I don't want to have too much weather helm. And if so, we need to high carter or start depowering the boat. Um, when the water's flat, as flat as it was that day, I'll tenderly rest the tiller on my hand, uh, the, the tiller extension on my on my leg and hand, and uh, and just try to keep it as still as possible. Yeah, you say still, but you're still steering a bit, right? So yeah, yeah. what are you steering for? Well, as you can see, there is some chop. So, you know, it would get hit with a wave and have to ease and turn the boat down a little bit. But I'm just trying to steer the boat and keep it as balanced as possible. And then, like I said, when we get hit with a puff, we want to hike hard as we are right there and maybe pull the vang on a little bit. And if I have to, ease the main sheet. So this is Sam steering. And, and I noticed that in general, Sam, um, Sam steers just a little less than Paul, even though Paul said he was you know, not steering very much. Sam, I think, steers even less. And you see sometimes he even puts the, the tiller behind him, does that frying pancakes thing to really steady out his steering. Uh, I do that as well. Um, Paul, you said you had some video of me when I was steering, right? And, and I did the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, when you hopped on the boat and I got in the power boat, I started watching you and yeah, you went straight to the tiller behind you sitting on the rail. Uh, it was, you know, to hold, hold it as steady as possible. I think in flatter water, for sure, you, could, you can get away with that. Although Sam's doing it now, uh, you know, when it's really flat, you can just nail the tiller down and hold it in place. Yeah, we have a little bit of that. Uh, so Sam was, um, you know, Sam was steering. This is flatter water, a little lighter wind, and he was really steadied out on the on the helm. Yeah, and really planning it there. Look how little it's moving. Look how neutral it is, right? Like it's actually pushing a little bit. Yeah, he's pushing there, and but it's so flat. Yeah, it's so flat, and and so let me move this out of the way. But I think that really, you know, especially if you're so flat that you're pushing on the helm, but that's really straight, right? The boat is, it, that helm is really yeah. neutral. Yeah. You know, basically the tiller is dragging through the water and he doesn't want to be moving it. It's flat enough water that you don't have to. So 
uh, that's what I would do in this or, or flatter water. That's what I do too. You know, it's worth talking about, you know, some of us are going to go to Tampa Bay next week. And, you know, the other extreme is, you know, when it's really is wavy and that can happen in Tampa Bay, right, Paul? Yeah. Yeah. Especially when the wind comes from the bridge, you can get the big rollers coming down the bay. Or those northerlies, if it's a little bit northeast and it comes down from all the way from the city of Tampa. But, you know, I'll, I'll pick up the tiller. I kind of have three different ways I hold it, like Sam has here, like we saw Paul on his leg, you know, I, and I like the reference of the leg because you can kind of feel how much you're using it, right? It kind of reminds you and dampens it a little bit. And then if it's really windy, I'll pick it up and I'll, you know, Mr. Microphone thing, right? Right. So I have all three styles I use for depending on how much I need to steer. Any questions from anybody, Paul? No, I haven't gotten anything yet. <clears throat> Got to make this as uh, interesting as possible. Ask us some questions so we can help you That's out. That's right. Yeah, keep us honest. Um, so I also thought it was interesting. You know, th these are similar. We can look at steering in these too. But um, when it's a little bit windier like this, uh, we're looking at the heel and and, you know, we always talk about sailing it flat, but it, it's not necessarily 100% flat, like zero, like you saw Sam there before in the, the flatter water. I think when there's a little bit of waves, a little bit of heel is nice, right? So if you look at Paul here. That's as flat as I ever sail. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then you look at Sam, let's fast forward, and he's a little bit flatter. Um, not much, but so I noticed when I was, you know, doing this training that in general, Sam sailed just a little flatter than Paul. Mm -hmm. It was always, you know, Sam was between, you know, one, zero and three degrees or, and Paul was between like two and four, you know, <laughs> real subtle difference, but you know, worth talking about. Um, yeah, Sam, Sam's so much younger and hikes so much harder, Mike. <laughs> yeah, but you were going well, Paul, like you yeah you weren't giving up anything. So it wasn't like healing this little bit. I'm not saying one's right or wrong. Uh, Sam was steadier on the helm and flatter and you were a little more helm and a little more healed, but you were going great. So um, I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong, but I, I can tell you that those, I think that's two extremes, right? Like, I don't think you want to heal much more than Paul is. And I don't think you want to go any flatter than Sam did. I think that's the range you're looking for. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think uh, obviously the video is going to catch what puff or what wall you're in. And so you can see Sam sitting in the boat, but then I think they're going to get hit with a puff. You see his crew will wing out. So it's. Uh, yeah. Know. So, so Sam did, you know, heal up a little bit more when the puff came, right? Like he wasn't afraid to, it wasn't like he just immediately kept it crazy flat. So Mike, I got a couple of questions. So first, uh, Ken asked, were the crew weights similar? And yeah, Ken, we really tried when we were testing that we had the boats within, you know, 10 pounds of one another. Uh, right. So I think, think yeah. that was fairly equal. Um, and then Robert asked, uh, what about sail trim in these conditions uh, with, the, with the wind? So, you know, Robert, I can say that, you know, when I was trimming on this day, you know, we were giving it all the power we could, pulling the main sheet in fairly tight. And then occasionally we would get hit with a puff and have to pull the vang on to start the depowering. So the boat didn't, you know, heal up too much. Um, but but we were we were probably, you know, flowing with the top tail tail and the mainsail 100% of the time. Um, you know, I don't think we could really stall it in this condition, uh, but, you know, definitely trim full. Yeah, so I think what you want to do here is that we're, we're transitioning between overpowered and underpowered. It's at that awkward range. And when you're underpowered, you don't want to be giving anything up. So you want to be trimmed all the way in. And when I say all the way in, we're looking at this top leech tail tail, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later. But um, and then as soon as you're overpowered, you're not looking at that anymore. You're looking at the horizon and trying to, you know, you're stealing, you're sheeting to the to the heel um, looking at the, the, in the distance and, you know, feeling the boat tip and stuff like that. So, so Mike, um, um, Aaron Holland asked, uh, so how fast do we steer when there's a wind shift? Um, so, you know, that's a great question. I think that's, um, you know, I, I could take my first stab at it. Maybe you do it a little different. You know, I think 
sometimes you 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 want to steer pretty quickly like i think you know you you want to react you don't want to jam it over but you want to get on the new the new wind direction pretty fast um so i think if i had to give you a number you know medium not not really quick but not slow either yeah i i i would think that a lift i'm going to jam it up there pretty quickly but in the header i may let it fall through the header a little slower and not not turn down quite as quick if i had to you know i also think you have to uh, differentiate between um you know a, a puff lift and a, and a wall header true like um you know i think a puff lift what what happens is you end up you know it, it kind of helps you head up right like the, the wind hits the sail you heal up just a little bit and and, I, and i'm okay with that because it helps you head up um, the wall header though is kind of interesting. It's sort of, I like, I like to kind of go down really slowly in a low wall header because, you know, I think as a boat slows down and the wind goes forward, the apparent wind goes forward and I don't want to be too quick to go head off. I, uh, right. I actually wrote an article about that. It's called pinch through the lulls describes kind of some detail on, on how that works. So uh, a couple of questions real quick. So Ken asked what the crew weight was of our teams. And I, I want to say, I think we were both around that 470 mark. Um, I think so. Yeah, we we um, we definitely mix and match the weights to get, uh, you know, we, we had a bunch of people helping us out and and yeah. we just, we, we cared more that the weight was the same, but I think we came out to about 470, which I think, I think is a great overall weight, right, Paul? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's all around weight. I, I probably sell anywhere between 465 and 475 is my, you know, go-to weight. And then um, I also had another question about the wind speed that we were done in this, in that, you know, we were sailing in these videos In this particular video, uh, the wind speeds were in that eight to 12 range. Um, I think we showed another video where Mike, where you were showing the steering of, um, it had gotten lighter. You'll notice it was a different direction with the shoreline, but that was on Friday and the wind was only about maybe five to seven. Yeah. So we, um, we actually had three days of testing and the, um, you know, the first and the third were good testing days. The, you know, it was a little lighter one day and a little heavier the other. And the, and the in-between day was just way too windy. So, right. To test, so. And this is a good video. Wayne, Wayne asked the question, Mike, he said, I understand the tiller in the aft hand, what do you mean about other styles? And I think I think what we talked about, yeah, the, the tiller is in the aft hand, but sometimes the hand's behind you and sometimes the hand's across your chest. So right, right. We're not switching hands on this. You know, we're we're just where you're putting the tiller. Yeah. So Sam's hand is in. behind him here. Yeah. And then it's on his leg in, in other pictures. And then I, I actually don't know what he does if it's you know really windy and wavy, but I bring it up more because you really gotta gotta kind of saw it sometimes to get through waves right and then another segue here mike um uh, john shockey asked what cut sails are shown so i'm using my new uh, dsd pluses that came out uh, about a year ago and mike you want to take the next answer yeah what, so this answer? is the you know so we've always been tweaking the uh the vs sail which is the old fisher main and um, you know we we kind of renamed it because to kind of show that we've we we're always playing with it. So every year, or every few years, I, you know sometimes I have a really good idea that I think is really good, and I try it, it doesn't work, and every once in a while it works. So we've been kind of tweaking the the little details of it um, often, and and just is just another tweak of it. Um, really subtle. We're just. Um, you know, we're actually, um, in this case, we've, uh, you know, North has a really nice, um, they call it molding system and, and they have a, a really good simulation and all that. And so we, we were just kind of really integrating it into that system so we could really do some simulation and, and we wanted to make sure we got it right. So this is really, it's in the system, but it's basically the same sale. And we were really just confirming that it was the same sale that we'd used last year. So that's my long answer to a short question. Sorry. Um, Kevin S asked a question about jib trim and we're gonna get to that in a little bit later because we've got some really good video on jib trim. But uh, John asked another question about upwind main trim. He wants to yeah. know, do, do we look at the angle of the main sheet when we're easing and trimming? Uh, you know. I, I guess 
uh, I do when I'm looking at when I'm starting to get overpowered and the boom starts to be let out, you know, halfway or almost to the corner of the transom. Um, that's when I start dropping my traveler and, and to the bottom of the tiller hole. And then I'm trimming my main sheet from there. So yeah, I kind of do pay attention to uh, the, the main sheet. You mean, so you're, you're saying you look back at, 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 at how far it is off the transom or what are you looking at? Yeah, I, I think um, if, if I'm at, looking at the question correctly, I think he's asking uh, when we start easing the main sheet and the angle uh, from, you know, center of the traveler, if we start easing that main out, then the angle of the main sheet starts becoming a 45. Oh, okay. I see what he's asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, so, I think I don't really look at that much. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, once it gets overpowered, you know, we mostly center the main, you know, and I, I pull it down a little bit. But you look at Sam here. He's so this is Sam's boat and um, there is no traveler. He's just got a pinned in the middle. Um, so once it gets overpowered, I'm way more looking forward at the horizon and how healed I am. And it, at some point, I don't really care how far out the main is. I don't care if it's, you know, kind of centered uh, or. Yeah, I, I think he's also. And so he's, uh, another question came just to confirm. So he's looking at the height of the boom uh, from the traveler. So he's look, you know, the distance. So I think about rake, um, uh -huh. you know, bo boats are getting farther forward, maybe. 26 11 and three quarters maybe 27 27 one so i know you know getting into the proctor mainsail the rake is much further forward because of the leech length um on the vs main and the dsd main our leech lengths are a little shorter so we're not too blocking and but but sam's is maybe uh a bit more forward i think i'm probably 26 10 and a half so I'm raked back a little bit more, John. So yeah, my boom may look a little lower than what uh, Sam's is in these pictures. In yeah, Sam. Sam's at 27. Um, 27. Yeah. I, okay. I'm not looking back. Uh, I, by the way, I, I do find uh, that Dan, when he sails with me, he looks back. He, he's kind of interested in what range we are. He likes to know if we're near the transition, like if it's windy and you get a lull, he looks back to see if we're sheeted in because he knows if I'm already sheeted in, the next lull he's gonna have to move in. Yep. Or if he has to keep, so that that's an important thing. So he looks back at it quite a bit and he's like, you're way out. And I'm like, I don't care, I'm flat, you know? <laughs> you know that's what I need to be, to keep the boat flat. Yeah, good crew. He knows what the boat mode's in, so. Yeah, so I mean, I often, you know, I, I talk about that a lot, right? Like what mode we're in. So. In this other video where it's kind of puffy right here and you know sometimes you're hike sometimes you're not you know i think in that one you know like like sam's not hiked here right and then the puff comes you know i i'm talking to the crew the whole time like you know you got to be in movement mode where we're, we're underpowered we're in underpowered mode and then once we're hiking full i'm like full hike full hike and they they have to know not to come in in the wall right um, how how constant do you do that, Mike? I mean, are you constantly talking through the entire upwind leg, or do you just give them, you know, thirty second or one minute intervals of what you have? I think intervals, but also when something changes, I update. You know, like if, if we're full hike mode and they get a little low, I'm like, we're still full full hike mode. You know, yeah. Or they might even ask. You know, like, and that's and that's when Dan looks back. He he wants to know. Right. He doesn't even ask anymore. He just kind of looks back, but. Um, but yeah, it's kind of when things change and then maybe every once in a, a little reminder, if I see somebody lean in and a lull, I'm like, nope, still full hike mode. Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, we kind of talk about uh, using the Vang and our depowering tools, but, you know, you got to remember that when we pull that Vang on and uh, uh, we get hit with a lull, we got to yeah. ease the Vang off and not stop hiking. And uh, instead of, you know, everybody's comfortable and wants to come in and get a break, but that Vang's still on. And that's really bad to, to be in that wall with that Vang on hard. So you got to remember to kind of reverse what you did when you were, you know, before you got hit with the puff. Yeah. So this is Sam with the Vang on. We were talking about, we actually, in this video, we were talking, we had just talked before this about that exact subject because it was pretty puffy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, having Sam play the, the, the main and he had John Duffett with him. It was his nationals crew. So they were pretty used to working together and John played the bang a lot. You know, every time the puff came, he would pull it on and, 
and you can actually see, you know, it's kind of flat down low here. And that's a sign that it's on. In fact, I almost think it's on a little too hard. They're not quite They're hiking. They're not hiking. Well. Yeah. Full, full disclosure to the teams we had, it was really cold and we got some people to come play with us, but I see the, the Ford's <laughs> grabbing the shroud there. Yeah. And I know the Ford crews are probably critiquing him right now, but just give him a break. He was volunteering <laughs> to come out and help us. So. Yeah, that's right. But, um, but yeah, the vein, but you know, whatever your weight is and, or your hiking ability, you know, you're going to hit a point where you need to depower and, and that is the depower tool is your vein. Yeah. And then once the vang doesn't work, you're, of course you have to have your settings, right. You better have your shims in and your alcohol out and, but, and you have everybody hiking, but after that, you know, put the vang on. And then the last thing you do after the vang's on and doing everything else, right. You got to start using your sails. Yeah. Um, I don't have any more questions right now, but somebody was asking about jib trim and well, you know, timing. To... talking about jib trimming. So I, um, I got hopped on, I was taking photos of the sale. That's why I got the stripes and, and, um, I was sitting up in the bow cause I had just taken the picture of the jibs jump from boat to boat. And I'm like, Hey, that's a pretty cool view. So I, uh, I figured I'd video and then I'm going to, just going to play this through, but I'm, I'm having Paul's team, this is on Paul's boat, uh, trim in the jib and we're watching the leech tail tail. And, um, you know, this is what we wish we could see better through the, through the main window, right? Like that's yeah. what we're kind of looking for. Uh, we're looking at two things. We're looking at this distance off the spreader. Um, and then we're also looking at this leech tail tail. And so you see Paul's out a bit. I think that's, you know, a little bit too loose now. And on purpose, we're asking him to kind of have it eased and then pull it in a little bit, a little bit more. And we're just going to let this play out. And you can see it gets kind of jumpy when it gets tight. See, it's kind of stalling out there. So that's, you know, an inch off the spreader or something. So that's too tight. So it was really fun kind of watching him kind of trim in and out and get in that stally range and then ease it out to get going again. Um, and the one thing that, that was really interesting, Mike, is I, I wasn't actually trimming it, my crew was, but it's amazing. You were doing clicks on yeah. the ratchet block. You know, we have, I have a ratchet box on my boat, and it was like click, click, click. And just, I think it was four clicks was that entire range. Yeah, and, the, the jib trim matters within a click. And, and I can see, I can see him clip trim in a click. That's a click, you know, and... and when he trims it in and a little bit more, that's another click. That's a click, right? Yeah. So, you know, what I find is that if you trim it in, that 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 bleach telltale is flowing, it's flowing, and you trim it in one more click and it gets jumpy. Like the difference between one click at the end there uh, is, is noticeable. So it's pretty amazing uh, how sensitive. It's funny because whenever you I ask somebody, hey, trim in your drip just a little bit. You know, they, they pull it in like two inches, you know, they think that's a little bit. And I'm like, no, 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 clicks, you know, count clicks. Well, I don't think everybody has ratchets. So that's kind of a feel thing. Yeah. But, but the equivalent of a click, you know, a click yeah. is only, gosh, I don't even know what a click is. It's maybe a eighth of an inch or something. Eighth right? of an inch. Yeah. Three yeah. sixteenths, maybe. Um, uh, Lewis asked how long my middle spreaders are. And uh, you know what? Uh, they're as long as the diamond wires are made by Doug Labor. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting. You don't put little of those ticklers on, Paul. I, I, I really like those. That I like to put them on. I put them off well, and 10 and a half inches off the mass. We have our jib sheets marked for the, you know, so that's one reference frame of reference, but we're watching the telltale. So, mm. you know, I really don't care if, the, if there's a straw there or not. We're looking at the telltale and it's going to be the same you know, if one spreader was three inches longer than the other, it, it really only matters about that leech telltale in the jib. So you're just not looking at that distance. So, you know, uh, I, I, I think we I, just I, use that as a reference instead of marks on the sheet, but I think marks on the sheet can be, you know, yeah. equally good. Yeah. I mean, obviously we're looking at the, we're looking at it through the window, but, you know, we pull that in until we start to see that leech telltale start to dance a little bit. If we know we're too tight, then it's being eased, but um, you know, just pulling it till it hits the straw type method, you know, just never have done it. Okay. So. Uh, I personally like the, um, the straw method, you know, I use a, a zip tie 
uh, 10 and a half inches off, but I, I just like it because I inserted it before the race. We, we, we play around with this stall and leech telltale. And I think it's a really nice reference. I actually like it better than the marking of the sheets because, you know, if there's a little puff, the leech opens. So the mark might be the same, but the jib is out further in a puff and then a big lull comes and it comes in, a, you know, quite a bit it changes, I think. Right. Willis so, asked, he said, is the spreaders are longer than the length of the North tuning guide. Um, I think the most thing, most important thing, Lewis is again, um, Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, Paul. What, what was the question? Uh, well, Lewis was just uh, sta stating that his spreaders are longer than the length of the North Tuning Guide. What do you mean the spreaders are long? Oh, you mean the, the, they make the diamonds too tight? Uh, well, that's the question I was going to ask him. So oh. um, we're, we're really concerned with not the length of the, of the, well, let me get back. When the mast is made with those diamond wires, uh, they're a set length that Doug Labor made them. And so we generally have to cut our spreaders to get our tuning numbers to the right number. So if your spreaders are really long, you may check and see how tight that middle diamond wire is with your loose gauge. And if it's too, uh, you say you're 484. Okay, well. Um, so if you're 484, then you don't need to cut them off. You they, don't need to cut them, you're, you're yeah, good. So, uh, you know. I guess the thing would be is how much longer are they? It, it could be that the wires are just longer than normal on your, on your mast and you had to, you know, push them out there in order to get that tension. And yeah. So something else is wrong. That's what I'm thinking. Something. I think what you mean then is that the, the spreaders are like longer than that 10 and a half. Right. That's what I'm saying. To get the tension that he's at, he's probably at closer, maybe 11 inches just because the wire links were maybe a little long. Yeah, so something's wrong with the wire lanes. So that's that's the answer there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know the standard wire lanes from Doug are, you know, definitely put you, you know, I I would say I think mine are probably three quarters of an inch or something, so shy of that ten and a half. So they they stick out, you know, nine and three quarters or something like that. And they're a little different side to side just because it's really hard to get the diamonds lengths exactly the same. <laughs> So one's like nine and a half, the other's like nine and three quarters or something like that. Any other questions on the jib trim here? Uh, uh, Hursto wanted to know about when we're going to talk about sail trim and mass tuning. I think we're talking about sail trim right now. Uh, as far as mass tuning goes, uh, Hursto, are we talking about a thistle? What, what, uh, what kind of boat are we sailing or do you sail? So, well, anyway, you can talk yeah, about, the but, I, but I think, I think what, yeah, we, we can, we should touch on that a little, and this is a good picture to kind of look at just to remind us about the diamonds that, you know, we're going with the VS main, we're going, uh, you know, we're still at the four, nine, four. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, we're sticking with that. Every time I try something different, I don't like it. So I go right back to it. I've experimented with a, ton of different tuning numbers and just keep coming right back to that uh kind of came up with those numbers in the late 90s and never never looked back you know mid, mid yeah. 90s and when i first got in the boat that first year that's that's what i did and it was a little lighter than people were sailing at the time on the diamonds uh, especially the bottom and the top one um so it just seemed a little looser it seems to work really well with the mat with the sail and um I really like it. So yeah. I don't change them. There's no, no condition where I, you know, it's not like it's windy or light. I, I move them. How about you, Paul? Yeah. So uh, Robert asked about the, uh, you know, the numbers being 494, assuming it's a top, middle, bottom on the lose. And that's correct. You know, Robert, we're using the, you're using the black gauge or are you still using the silver gauge, Mike? I, I only use the black gauge. I think only it's use the black gauge. Yeah. So I'm at 411.10 and with my DSD mains. Uh, so yeah, we're a little bit different setup based of, mainly because of the love curve. And yeah, these are the pro numbers, uh, Robert with the black gauge. So, yeah, I really don't, by the way, the, the numbers at the low end of the two gauges are very similar. So a four, nine, four on the silver gauge is, is pretty much the same as the four, nine, four on the black gauge. It's at the higher numbers that they, they start yeah. to vary quite a bit. Yep. Yep. For sure. I mean, we've talked about this before, but I really, those, those silver gauges just, you know, get inaccurate so quickly that I don't like to use them. 
Um, you know, um, we had a really interesting uh, one day when we first got out there. I can't remember which day it was. I think it was Friday. Um, it was really interesting. I'm going to show you this video of some wind shear. And, um, you know, it, it was pretty fascinating that on starboard tack, you know, this is Sam sailing and we, he could not get the leech telltale to flow on starboard tack. It was pretty light when it was just filling in and he couldn't get it to flow on starboard tack. You know, he had to like let it way out. So he's looking at, you can see him looking up, trying to get that thing going. And uh, it, it's not flowing, right? Um, so, so you can see how far out his main is now and it's still not flowing. It's pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, well, light air, you get that, that variation from the top of the mast to the water. And well, it's only a thistle, but you still get a lot of shear. So the shear, I mean, so in this case, the wind was too far uh, right. So we could never get, it was always stalled up top. And then on port tack, you can see that he couldn't get it to stall. Yeah. So the wind was so far right that you can, I hope you can see, can you guys see that? Paul, you can see it, yeah, right? I can see it, yep. You can see that telltale right there on his. Yeah, and person. it's flowing. And even though it's super, super tight main. So I thought that was really interesting. You know, what do you do about this when you get it? Well, you know, you don't do this, you know, you're just kind of stuck with it. You know, it's not worth letting your main out really far. You guys got to, ease it a little bit and go with it. And same with the other tack. You don't want to just choke it so hard that, you know. So this is sort of the exception to watching that top telltale and getting it flowing 50% or something like that. Yeah. It's really interesting. And then, you know, it built a few knots more from here and that wind shear went away. So Mike, uh, Charlie wanted to ask some uh, Proctor mainsail questions and different yeah. techniques using the Proctor main. Um, you know, I think Charlie in the few times that I've used the Proctor, uh, you know, it's all main sheet driven, uh, leech, leech needs to be tight. We're basically two blocking most of the time and using the traveler to balance the helm, uh, kind of opposite the way we do with the VS and the DSD, uh, where we're using the, a lot more Vang, but the principles for the balance of the boat are the same. And, uh, you know, I would, I would think that, you know, you're going to be trimming the main hard. And then when you get hit with that puff, you got to be really active with that traveler. Um, I, I know you well, Charlie, you're very good at it. So, um, you know, I don't know if there's anything I, I can really help you with, but, well, um, I can add some to that. I mean, I, I did use the Proctor main for a while and it, and it, it worked well. It was great. Um, the, so when you're underpowered, those the same principles help like with the, that top leech telltale, uh, we're shooting for that thing flowing maybe 50% of the time is a great starting point. And that's true with, you know, the VS of, the, you know, the DSD or the Proctor. So that's the same, you know, the same concept still holds. And then, you know, the differences in heavy air where we're bank sheeting, you know, that's kind of what we named the VS after bank sheeting. And, um, you know, put the bang on and you gotta look when you, when you start letting the main out to, to depower the bottom of the main with the bang and so the bang and the boom doesn't rise. And then a very different concept with the proctor. Uh, when you're depowering, it's very different than when lighter, when you're doing something different, you're letting the, the traveler down. And, you know, one interesting thing about that advantage of it is that by keeping the main sheet tight, you're, you're bending the mass, which is flattening the sail, but you're also keeping your force stay tight. Yeah, that's what I'm going to mention. So um, that's kind of the advantage yeah. of that system. Kerbin wanted to know, so when when do you really go for the Vang with the Proctor? Uh, I mean, is it is it just taut? So if you do ease the main sheet, the boom's not going to rise too high? Or are we really bending the mast with the boom, uh, with the Vang to depower? So when I sailed with the Proctor, I, I, I wasn't, we weren't nearly as active on the Vang as we are with the VS. The, um, yeah. you know, the, every puff and law we're playing the bang and in a breeze and in, in the proctor you really you're, you're getting your mass bend um from that sheeting and also the the proctor has a lot less luff curve in the first place so yeah. it's made for a straighter mass to begin with it's set up with a very straight mass when you're tuning it and um if you put the bang on and sheet it just those overbend wrinkles just shoot back in the in the boat so you can see here you know, there's, you know, when we're talking about those overbend wrinkles, um, 
Hang on, I'll just draw some on here. But yeah, you see these, these lines here. And if you put that vang on and that proctor, they just, these things just shoot right back to the corner of the sail. So I didn't use a lot of vang. I don't know if some of the people that have more experience with it than I do do, but that's what I did. Yeah, I can remember uh, seeing the Joyce's. I think they had some vang on at times and you can really see those overbend wrinkles go to the back of the boom. But yeah. then you clean it up with a little Cunningham, so. Yeah, but you can only do so much. You, you're certainly not, I, I don't think you're pulling it nearly as hard as you are with the uh, right. DS and the DSD. Yeah. Cool. So uh, any more questions? Anybody have anything else about sailing up when or depowering? Let me know. Yeah. We've um, got some other cool videos to show you. Yeah, we do. Actually, we're going to, we, that, that second day, uh was was really windy and and we made a we made a choice not to sail it just wasn't wasn't worth testing the sail right it's not gonna it's gonna be testing our technique and not whether the, the new sail we looked at was was worked or not um but so but we this did have some we did. fun yeah we had some fun so we decided to go out and that's sam driving his boat and it's me on a foil board there so we went out and played around we got going it was pretty fun. We, uh, I first towed Sam and we put the spinnaker up and it was actually, it was too much. <laughs> he wiped out hard. So yeah, yeah. it's worth playing it's, this out. Cause I have it's interesting fun. not how, how little load is on the line that you're, you're holding on to. <laughs> yeah. So this is just, um, a line we tied to the back and there's, there's so little drag with the foil that you're just kind of can hang on it with a couple fingers, even with, with nothing. In fact, it's almost a problem. You have nothing to pull against. So yeah. All right. Hey, Mike, we got to go back to work. Hey, so, sorry, uh, sorry about that. So right, hang no, on. We gotta, right. So we hey. one thing. We got to see the crash. Hang on. We'll see that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Coming up. It's coming up soon somewhere. So while, while we're watching, so Wayne wants to uh, Wayne Balzinger. Hey, Wayne. Uh, he says, do we have a go. view? <laughs> do we have a view on what cuts have the widest groove and the easiest to stay in the groove? I think that's you know we're talking about jibs um you you've pretty much said with the with the proctor jib you know um, i know you've you've done some testing with the uh the old fisher jib vs jib now and i've got the dsd and i've sailed with all three um you you really looked at the dsd jib this past uh training session what do you think of the uh, entry and the exits of the three jibs mike um so yeah, I, I wasn't sure if the question was limited to the jib or not. Did is that did he say that or was it? I just didn't, kind of in didn't say that, but we talked about the widest yeah. groove. I'm thinking, uh, you know, how you're steering off the jib primarily. So Wayne, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but well, I you know I do think though that um, you know we I think we should talk about the mains too. I think that um, you know the but we'll come back to that in a second. So the 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 proctor jib is the fullest. And um, it, it's got, and this is the DSD right here. And you can see that when Paul trims, it actually comes inside the rail. And if you look at, let me find one that, of Sam here in a minute. Um, but so just kind of remember what that looks like with that in the rail. So his is a little bit flatter than the, uh, the Proctor. And that's the, you know, the combo I like is the VS main, the Proctor jib. And let me see what else I got. This is, um, uh, this is another video. I'm just seeing if I have one of Sam. Here we go. Here's Sam with the Proctor jib. Uh, and you can see that that one goes all the way out to the rail. So you can see the difference in these two that, you know, Paul's got it tighter. Um, and that's just because it's flatter. And then, you know, and then the, the, the VS jib is somewhere in between. You know, so I think that, you know, the... Well, actually, the V, I think the VS main, uh, the VS jib is the flattest of the three. Right. I'm sorry. That's the flattest yeah. of the three. Right. And the VSD is in the middle. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the, the fuller the jib is, the kind of you, you kind of have a little wider groove. And um, that's one of the reasons I think I like the, the Proctor jib. And, um, you know, they definitely behave a little differently that way. Uh, but I also think, you know, if you look at, some of the subtle differences of the mains, you know, the DSD, I think has a little more open leech. And I think that makes it potentially a little more forgiving. 
Um, you know, I think with the, with a lot of hook in the VS main, you got to be a little bit careful not to over trim it. Like it's, you can stall it a little bit easier. So I think that's probably a little less forgiving. Um, I like it cause you know, I think I can get a lot out of it, but I, I think if I trim it wrong, I go slow for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would agree with everything there, Mike. I think the, with the DSD, I, I can trim really hard without closing the leech off too quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And the setup is fairly easy. I don't, I don't have to use shims to achieve, uh, you know, I, I think, I know you and Sam definitely go through your shimming. Um, to, right, to and I think it. that's a little bit of the unforgiving, right? If you, right. I think with it, well, that hook, if you have a straight mass, you have a lot of hook. So when you do need to flatten your main, you got to put those shims in to make sure the, the main's flat enough, but also make sure your leech is open enough enough. It's, it's hard to, you know, it's back to that statement that it's really easy to over trim and that makes it un, a little less forgiving, I think. Everything's a trade-off, right? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, with all of our, our friends that we have sailing and all the lakes and the open water and stuff, um, I, I know you said you prefer the Proctor uh, jib. It's a little more full and maybe more forgiving, but do you think there's one jib suited for a certain body of water? Yeah, you know, when people ask me like, uh, hey, I sail on really flat water, you know, and so which jib should I use? I say, yeah, that's probably a good one for the for the VS jib. That's the flattest jib. And, and um, you know, if somebody says they sail in choppier water and, you know, I think a lot of our nationals are in more open water. And I, so I think the little fuller jib of the proctor seems to, to pay off for me. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, the, the DSD is that nice compromise in between. So I'm not sure if that makes anybody's choices any easier, but, you know, I think if you sail primarily on really flat water, you know, that little flatter jib can be okay. Yeah. I did, um, I did do an Atlantic coast and we were doing really well. And, and, um, you know, somebody asked what sales we were using. And I said, Oh, my usual, you know, the Proctor jib. And, and then I was, John Baker was sailing with me and he leaned over and he goes, we're using the, the, the VS jib. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> so, you know, I think these, these differences are actually pretty subtle is my point. And, and I didn't even notice it at the time. I just was sailing and sailing to my jib tail tails and was going just fine and open water. And I think that was Tom's river. So just a food for thought for you. Um, let's see here. Uh, Robert would like to ask, you know, is, is there a good article or description about using shims? Um, you know, we've written, a, there's a bunch of bagpipes uh, articles that I've written in the past about when and how to shim. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and I don't know if there's another article handy, but for sure there's some bagpipe ones. Uh, we probably should dig that up, Paul, and resurrect it or maybe even rewrite it again now that yeah. uh, we've kind of fine-tuned that stuff um and we can talk to that for a moment um you know bottom line is i i sail the vs with a with at least one shim i, I never sail with no shims and um let me ask you this question so if, if you if you always sail with one shim what would happen if you just tightened your shrouds and your head stay one click wouldn't that achieve the same thing um not really because i like that really that gap i like the fact that it rocks i think it's really important I don't know. So, so you don't have so you, so that's a great thing mike that you just brought up so the mass step and the mass butt the way they marry you don't have a lot of rocking into that so what you've done is by using a shim you've created that fall so the mass can rock forward on the mass step. That is correct. So if okay. you look at, you know, if this is your mass step, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and then you put a, a stem in here and then your mass is on top of that, right? Yeah. right. And, you, you know, you have this gap in the front here that you can, you can do something with, right? If you didn't put a shim in, you know, it would just be, you know, one on top of the other. And that would it wouldn't and, rock. And just for the record, do you have a flat mass step? No. So my mass step um, is does not look like exactly like that. So yeah, I, yeah, that's what I just want to clarify. Yeah, no, it's fair, fair, fair clarification. So my mass step, I was just trying to do something quick and dirty there. But you know, my mass step, if if um, you know, 
let's say the the bow is forward so you know so we'll make a little arrow so this is the forward part of the boat right um so my mass step is i have a troops hang on let me undo that there's a short distance here flat and then there is a taper like that and then it goes like this so this is the mass step not the mass butt the butt is this the standard right midwest butt and um there's i've forgotten the exact rules you know somebody on maybe Wayne, I, uh, I don't know if Wayne Pinole is online or somebody that knows this exactly, but I think it's three sixteenths you're allowed to do here. That's cor correct. Is that correct? Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yep. So I'm the max amount. I'm three sixteenths here. Yep. And um, that's that distance. And I, I think that distance is one inch or three quarters of an inch or something. Right. So it's, it's enough so that when I put my shim on, you know, if my shim looks like this, you know, it fits just like that, you know, it kind of yeah. goes on the flat spot. Right. So you put all that together and, and there's a pretty big gap here. And I like it because it becomes this, this throttle, right? I come out of attack, my main sheet's eased, the mass is pretty straight. And then as I sheet in, it, it tips forward or you bang, it tips forward and it's got plenty of distance to go. Right. And the VS main is made with a lot of luff curves, so it can take a lot of mass bend. Yep. Charlie um, asked. Uh, Charlie asked that you know he was a big advocate. Of, uh, Brent Brent Barberhan, I guess, sailed because there's only one Brent that I. Well, I know a couple of Brents, Brent McKenzie as well. But anyway, Brent uh, said that he was a strong advocate of trimming, included in front to control overbending. Um, I tell you, I can speak to that, Charlie, because I have a tapered step. And I, I can get a lot of mass bend. And so I shim in front of my mast to control that, that same thing. I, I can actually turn, you know, turn my sail because I don't have quite the luff curve that the VS main has. And I can overbend it pretty easily. So I will use shimming in front, especially when there's waves to keep the power in the mast and, uh, and not allow the main to over flatten. Um, I don't need a shim in back to get the proper mass bend for my sail, but I bet if I used the VS main, I would, because I would need to encourage a little more mass bend. So. Yeah. Um, so I never put a shim in front and I always have at least one shim yeah. because of the, has a bunch of bend, you know, and, um, and Sam's the same way. Sam doesn't either. Uh, but when I sailed with the Proctor, um, I found it was really easy to overbend the mast. And I actually ended up shimming in front of the proctor as well when I really wanted power. Like if I got in some chop or something like that and I wanted right. and um, didn't want to overbend the mass. And uh, I thought it was, it was pretty effective. It worked. So, you know, you're really matching the, it, it's surprising how well this works. You know, if you kind of, if you look at, you know, what a mass will, will do, it'll, you know, bend just on this lever arm is a terrible drawing of a mass but you know so this this tapered mass step you know just by levering it off the back here makes the thing bend surprising amounts mm -hmm. yep. you know the other thing it's interesting the other thing that adding shims do does is actually tightens your shrouds and forestay Right. Well, that's why I asked the question, you know, you said you always have one shim and I'm thinking, well, why don't you just tighten your shrouds and force stay one click and it would achieve the same thing. Yeah. But, and it, it doesn't though, because of that gap. Yeah. And, and I find, right. you know, if, but if you had, I guess if you had more fall, yeah, well, it depends. So um, I, and this is, this is in a lot of different boats that I see when I'm tuning is that the mass, butt is different on new mass, in my opinion, than what it was 30 years ago. And the curvature on the mass butt has, has gotten maybe a little greater. So the mass rocks a little more freely. Um, well, you know, when I think in the end, what you care about is what your overband wrinkles look like, right? right? So, you know, these are the tuning guy gets you close. And then, you know, I, I did a Midwinter's West and I borrowed a boat um, I think Mike, 
Mike set me up with a boat. It was great. But the mast was, I'm like, this mast is super stiff. And, um, and it was so, it felt so wrong to me that, well, it's not wrong. It's just stiffer. And then uh, one of the guys we were, we were tuning with also borrowed a boat. And he's like, this mast sounds, feels really flexible. So we actually hung weights from them. And, and sure enough, they were, they were pretty different. And um, so all I did was I actually had, you know, I went to shims sooner to help it bend more. And he went and left shims with the same sail. We just both used it. And we were both funny fast. So just because you have a little different mast doesn't mean you're slow. There's nothing wrong with a stiffer or more flexible mast. But you can't just blindly follow the tuning guide and, Definitely. and expect that it's going to come the same. Because um, maybe I can find that. I can clear all this now. Um, I can go back to... Hold on, I gotta get rid of the annotation stuff. I think there was that one, you know, there was one of these that I showed you guys, the, the overbend wrinkles, right? So, yeah, so this is a different one, but it's the same idea. You know, I like this look. So this is, you know, Sam sailing mm -hmm. and he's got just subtle overbend wrinkles. They go maybe half, he's a little overpowered. So, you know, this is kind of what you really care about and what you're looking for. So if you're mad, if this is going all the way to the back, and actually it'll go right down to the corner, if this is what they look like, then you need to take a shim out or put a shim in front. Right. And I don't care which sail you're using. Yep. And if it looks more like this and you got nothing, you got to bend the mass a little more if you're overpowered. And, and Mike, explain why we want those overbend wrinkles. What does that do to the jib in, the, in, in between? Yeah, so what's happening is if your mass is too straight, you know, if you look at the profile of the main, you know, this, this typical shape, right? You know, if that's your, your perfect shape, you've got your cord here. And, you know, as you bend the mast, let's take a different color here. You know, so maybe you bend the mast and, and the back doesn't change a lot, right? But the front changes quite a bit. And if you bend the mast, it'll look more like this, right? And then if you're trying to match that up with your jib, right? So here's, you know, here's your mast, right? In one position and the other. Right. You know, it, it really helps the slot, you know, this kind of, this sharp edge, the, the knuckle forward look, I call it is not good. So you really want something, you don't want the front of the main to be too round. And you can see in Sam's here, it's not, right? It's fairly straight. You know, it's not a good drawing, I apologize. But you get the idea, right? Like you can see, because we have draft stripes on, that it's not that, I don't know if it's, it's I always call it knuckle forward. Like if you hold your hand up and you put your knuckles bent, you know, it's really forward. And if it looks like that, you got to bend your mast. Yeah. Yeah, I had a sail designer just really, we, we talked about it once and it really just opened my eyes that, you know, those, those wrinkles are the sail that's being sucked in and flattened and it's allowing the slot to stay open. And if we didn't, if we didn't have those overbend wrinkles, then the slot's going to be compressed and we're not going to get a good airflow. So right. that's, that's why we're looking for those overbend wrinkles because it's, you know, a visual to let us know that our, our mast and our sail is doing exactly what we want it to do. So yeah, and and what you're doing is when you when you start to see overbend wrinkles, your your mast bend is matching the luff curve. So a luff curve, when we make the sail, we put a luff curve in, right? And it's you know, it kind of looks like, you know, if you look at the profile of the main, hang on, I got I kind of have my message open by accident here. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, that's all right. And while you're talking, uh, David Shively asked, is that too much heel in that picture? And yeah, I think in a snapshot, David, that is more heel than you would want. But I think uh, he just got hit with a puff. So. Yeah, so I think they just didn't react to this puff. So yeah. I think they weren't really paying attention. To that. I, absolutely, that's too much heel. I think they just weren't settled in. So, yeah, good catch, though. And you know that, that's a really good point, though. You, you, it's if you're not paying attention, that's when you sort of you really got to focus on it to get keep your heel right. 
you know, I think I'm talking to them about something and all of a sudden they heal up. Right. Right. Right there. That's, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good catch though. Um, so when we talk about left curve though, the left curve is the, you know, how much is in the built, how much extra shape is built in the front of the sail. You know, it's not a straight line from the, from the head to the, the clue, right? So I'll draw that real quick. Um, actually, I make it rid of the photo here. Get a little easier. Okay, so if you look at, um, you know, I'm trying to draw with a cursor here, but if that's your leech, here's your foot, and you know, I'm gonna draw a straight line Suppose this is, you know, your mast, right? You know, the sail, along your mast, the, the sail is not built straight like this. It's got luff curve. It's got, you know, shape here. And, um, you know, it's in the order of, of inches, right? It's, so this, this distance is probably, you know, on the VS is probably like three inches or something. And the, the DSD is probably like one and a half and the, proctors like one or something right so that's why i need more mass bend to get those those overbend wrinkles so just the different styles right so we've got a couple more minutes left mike uh is there anything else you want to hit and anybody else have any more questions that we can help you out with um looking forward to midwinter's east it's been a while since uh, yeah. we sailed the thistle, this should be fun. Uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a shameless plug. If you're planning on coming to the Orange Peel Regatta in a few weeks, we're looking forward to having you. Please go and register. Everything's on the Thistle Class webpage. And then, uh, yeah, looking forward to being at Midwinter's East as well. And uh, as you all know, everybody that's gone has been there before. You know, we got we do have the full lineup of, um, you know, the, the Coach TCA. Uh, you know, Tom Hubble's running and you know, uh, we actually have Al Trehoon coming in from, from North. He's won the nationals twice. And so he's going to be in a motorboat for a couple of days. So that'll be a, a good, you know, off the boat look for y'all. And that'll be great for any of you that are going, that'll be, you know, pick his brain, pick ours, you know, you guys know the drill. Yeah. All right. Any last questions before we, uh, no, no more questions. I uh, just want to thank everybody for coming and paying attention to uh, Mike and I tonight and Laura in the background for putting this all together and helping us out. Perfect. Um, well, thanks, guys. Uh, we wanted to keep this to an hour, so we're spot on an hour. So we're going to we're going to shut it down now. So, yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to Mike and myself. Um, yep. probably have our cell phone number. So we'll hear from you in about 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and, you know, and, you know, send us an email or whatever. We're happy to help. So awesome. we're open books. Yep. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks guys.